written. Um, not too many notes on, on worship, other than we're going to leave the back half of the lights off during these Lenten services. Um, to encourage you to sit together in a group on both sides like you are. That encourage our singing and to encourage you forward. So if you are in the dark right now, there are seats up front for those of you. <laughs> Why don't we stand? Entire service, other than a few of the hymns, are in that purple uh, sheet that's right in the center. You can grab that if you haven't already. And we begin with this call to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, source of all goodness and life, who clothes us with Christ Jesus and makes us one by the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, the Father, forever. In peace let us pray to the Lord. between nations, faithfulness in the church, and the healing of creation, let us pray. And all who long for God, let us pray. Abandoned or afraid, let us pray. Oh, 
This evening is from 1 John, the fourth chapter. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God, and God lives in us. This way, love has run of the house, becomes at home and matures within us, so that we're free to, of worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one that is not fully formed yet in love. We, though, we are going to love. We're going to love and be loved. First we were loved, and now we love. God loved us first. If anyone boasts, I love God, and then goes right on hating his brother or sister, think nothing of it. He's a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God that he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. The word of the Lord. note on that, that was from The Message, which is a paraphrase of scripture uh, written by Eugene Peterson, a nice, a nice addition to your Bible collection if you don't have it. Um, and I got one more note here before we uh, have this homily. The, the thoughts and the stories in tonight's homily and even some of the sentences are taken 
from the second chapter of Vanishing Grace uh, by Philip Yancey. It's a book about how the one place that should be uh, great dispensers of grace, the church, is failing at that task. Glenn Harris is leading a study of this book at 6.30 on these Lenten Wednesdays, right before this worship service throughout Lent. And my homilies will be taken from different chapters in this book uh, throughout this Lenten series. So the book is called Vanishing Grace by Philip Yancey. So all of you, humanity longs for two things. Two things. First, a sense of meaning, a purpose for our life. We want to believe that our life matters. That's the first thing. We want to believe our life matters. And the second thing is, we long for a community where we belong, where we are accepted. We want to believe that our life matters to someone else. First thing is we want to believe our life matters. The second thing is we want to believe our life matters to someone else. Yet, even though these are exactly the things that you would hear in any Christian church preached week after week after week after week, the majority of the people in this country do not trust the church to carry out or fulfill either of those two things. And it's because our presentation is not very convincing. Church ends up turning more people away from God instead of to God, if you go strictly by the numbers of who's in our pews and who's not. The perception by outsiders is that they are welcomed if they would make potential new members, right? And those who do not fit into our preferred demographic or sense of moral goodness are often ignored when they do visit our churches, or they're made to feel unwelcome. There is a Christianity Today article that cited some common complaints from non-Christians about Christians. And two of them were, you don't listen to me and you judge me. Now think about it. When we ask someone outside of the church, what is the first word that comes to mind when, I, when you think of the word Christian, what are the chances that their answer is going to be love? To me, this feels like fundamental failure of the church. I don't believe many churches are good at loving the stranger. Some of us are better at serving the stranger, but loving the stranger, are we a loving church? Most members within a church would say, yeah, we're loving because they've experienced that love inside that church. But if you ask it the other way, do outsiders feel loved when they come here? That's a different sort of question. And so it depends. Some outsiders definitely come into churches and they feel loved. They have an easier time of it. Since uh, Thad has been gone, I've been visiting with new people in our congregation. This is something that Thad used to do. And so I've had a lot of these visits over the last few months. And what I thought about today, as I was thinking about this topic, was something that brought shame to me. I realized that everyone that I have visited, and I've visited a lot of people in the last few months, resemble me. I don't mean that they're bald, lumpy, and middle-aged. That's the real me. I mean they resemble how I imagine me to be. Professional, youthful, well-spoken, attractive. It's my imagination. White. Now, were these the only sort of people that visited Messiah in the last few months? The answer is no. Were these the only people that felt welcome enough by us, therefore visited long enough that I might have noticed them? Well, that might be true. Were these the only sorts of people that I noticed or even subconsciously wished to encourage because they looked like the ideal perfect new member? Well, maybe we're getting somewhere. It's no big deal to love someone that looks like us. It takes real effort 
real efforts of grace to see God's image in someone who's not in our image. And even tougher is to love someone who is your enemy. A, a unique command of Jesus. There is a soldier who's created a website asking Christians to adopt a terrorist to pray for. Adopt a terrorist to pray for. He got his list of terrorists from the Department of Defense, list of the most dangerous terrorists. He received a thousand volunteers, but he received far more than a thousand complaints about his website, with some saying that it was immoral to harbor anything but hate for these monsters. And many of those responses came from Christians. I have sat with many Christians who have said, I can forgive almost anyone except, and then they fill in their blank child molester, drunk driver, someone who harms my family. We all have got boundaries to our love. But God doesn't have boundaries to God's love. The more unlikely people we love, the more unlikely people we love, the more we resemble God, who after all even loved people like us. In the book of Acts, Paul was there the day that the disciple Stephen was murdered, stoned to death. And Stephen's last words were a prayer to God to forgive these people who were killing him. One of those was Paul, who later was indeed forgiven and encountered God and Jesus on the Damascus Road. Could Stephen's prayer have had something fundamental to do with Paul's conversion? Dr. Uh, Francis Collins is a noted MD and PhD. He headed the Human Genome Project, which you've probably heard about, the mapping of uh, our genetic uh, code. The work is the basis of groundbreaking medicine and has saved lives already and will save a lot more coming up. And he's also very open and vocal about his Christian faith. He's even participated in debates and gained some notoriety worldwide uh, debating strident anti-Christians, atheists, strident atheists, like Christopher Hitchens and, and Richard Dawkins debated both of them. Scientists in America have been embarrassed of him, even insulted him, uh, calling him in the press a clown, a wacko, and ignorant. He was made the director of the Nas National Institute of Health, and he held this post when atheist Christopher Hitchens, who wrote the book God is Not Great, was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And knowing each other from their public debates, Collins spent hours with the Hitchens family, going over choices of treatments for Christopher Hitchens, helping him find the most cutting edge treatments, using his influence as the director of National Institute of Health. And during Hitchens' ordeal, he received many hate-filled letters from Christians who took glee in the predicament that this strident atheist was being struck down by cancer. They saw it as a clear punishment from God. Some thought that God had even given him this particular cancer because he was speaking so against it and now this esophageal cancer was going to stop him from being able to speak. Some ugly things were written. Yet in one of Hitchens' last columns in the Vanity Fair, which he contributed to regularly, he paid tribute to Dr. Francis Collins. He called him a selfless Christian physician and a great humanitarian. He praised his work at helping science and religion speak to each other. And most impressive to Hitchens, according to his article and his words, was that he visited him while he was sick, sat with him, listened to him, and did everything within his power to help him. Christopher Hitchens died a committed atheist. But still, the only person that Dr. Collins ever saw was a child of God, made in God's image. How do we overcome all the bad press that Christians receive? rightly and wrongly? How do we become 
a more loving church. We simply love like Jesus, which means we love humbly, we love abundantly, and we love universally.
near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise by Christ in our journey of repentance and moved by his compassion, let us pray for the church and those in need and all of God's creation. We pray that you guide us during the season of repentance and renewal. Help us to take away everything that keeps us from loving relationships with Christ and with from one another. Guide us towards forgiveness for our hate, temper, and ignorance. Give us our trespasses. We forgive them. 
those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Closing song tonight will be a hopeful one for the church that we can create together out of love. And 641. Thank you. 